Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Good order. Ms. Thompson, you have the honors. Okay. If we could all just take a second and bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for us being here today and to look at the big decisions our county is going to be faced to make. I'm so thankful for these young people that are here and the opportunity they had this summer to go be around some outstanding leaders and see exactly what they have in the world at their feet to be successful one day. I pray that you will be with us. We will keep cool, man, cool minds and just solid hearts and think of every person when we vote because every person matters. In your precious name I pray, amen. amen. Stay and say the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have a motion as to the agenda? Motion to approve. Second. Have a motion and a second. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. I see a lot of young faces out here. The program you were just in is one of the most exceptional programs that Alamance County has. And I'm proud of each and every one of you. Mr. Laws. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioners, uh, for allowing us to um, showcase uh, a number of our Junior Police Academy graduates from the 2024 Academy. I'm joined here uh, by a number of our staff members from the Academy, as well as about half of the uh, graduates of the program this year. Um, as you well know, this is a, a four-week program that's run during the summer, a uh, collaborative effort between Burlington Police Department, the Sheriff's Office, Graham Police Department, and Mebane Police Department. And we work with students, middle school students, all over Alamance County. So that come from the seven middle schools in the Alamance Burlington school system. So uh, I would, uh, before we allow a couple of the cadets to come up and share this, their experience, because I'm sure you'd rather hear about their experience from them, um, I wanted to uh, present to the commissioners a, um, a plaque uh, signifying our appreciation and their appreciation to you all for your support, continued support, of what we try to do with the young people in our community with the Junior Police Academy. So I'd like to present this to you all at this time. And we thank you, and this will be hung for the entire next year downstairs. Anybody that comes in this building and the three courtrooms or the uh, administrative end will see your faces and your honor. Thank you. Thank you. It's a heavy black too. <laughs> So uh, why don't we just, uh, I'll, I'll introduce the cadets just by name, and then we'll allow a few of them to come up and share their personal experience. So I'm just going to go in alphabetical order. Malik Bogues, if you'll just stand up. R.J. Colson. Matthew Gould. Traden Graves. Brendan King. Braden Knight. Uh, Colin Petit. Rashad Sellers, Jaden Terrell, Joseph Woods, and then our female cadets that are with us, Leah Brown and Allie Lucas. Did I miss anyone? Okay. So why don't we start with uh, Allie Lucas. Uh, she was our top cadet uh, for the 2024 Academy. So we'll start with her and then uh, we'll go on to Leah uh, Brown will be next. We learned about how 
to behave ourselves and dare how to march. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my name is Leah Brown. Um, I was doing JPA because I was having behavioral issues in school. And I, at first I didn't want to do it because I didn't think it would benefit me in any way. I thought it would just be a waste of time. And when I started JPA, I was, I was still a little upset about the fact that I had to do it. But the further I got into the program, the more I understood what, what, like how it was benefiting me. I understood that I was learning respect. I understood that I was learning not to give up and how to, I don't know how to word it, but I was learning to always keep hope, like to not always give up just because I don't feel like doing something. I learned that if I really set my mind to it, I could probably get it done. So, and I did, with the way that the officers pushed me, I did like, with like they pushed me a lot. So I learned like, tr just giving up is not acceptable and it never will be acceptable. Um, and you always have to put in as much effort as you possibly can. Thanks. All we'll go with... Um, Before you go any sorry. further, you need to be a leader in your school and a public speaker. Mm -hmm. Wonderful job. We'll go with Colin Petit next. So Leah was our most improved female cadet, and Colin Petit was our outstanding character. He received our outstanding character award this year. I'd say the most important thing that we learned in the JPA was uh, self-discipline, and I came. I felt like I came into the JPA with confidence, and I left with even more confidence about myself, and I also learned how to control myself a lot better. And we thank you. Thank you. And now, uh, Trade and Graves. Um, I came into this program not with very much hope about it, but as I went on, I got more um, confidence with the program and with myself, and I thank the officers and the staff for that and what they've done for the rest of us here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners, for allowing us to be here tonight and for you uh, recognizing these uh, graduates of the 2024 Junior Police Academy. And we thank you so much. When I came to your dinner, RJ, I think you're at least four inches taller. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to watch you on TV one day, Kansas City Chiefs. You folks, with the advantage of this four-week class, now can become, go back to school and can be leaders mm -hmm. in your class, in your school. And, it, and those that did what you might have done previously but aren't going to do any further misbehave, uh, now you can help them learn and encourage them, if they need it, to participate in this program next year. Right. Thank you so much. Excellent work. Everybody give them one more. We have three speakers. Barry Joyce. Oh. Four speakers. I only have, oh, I do have four. Uh, Henry Chandler, I think, is first. Barry's up. He can go first. Fine. Yeah, right. That's fine. Well, 
I'm here That's again. Is that the first time you passed that many officers without being stopped? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm a known criminal in Alamance County. Um, well, I'm here again, and I notice you're going to be voting on something tonight, and it's, I don't know that I disagree with it. Uh, finally, we've, uh, after a year of fighting and, and support from a couple of commissioners here, Pam Thompson and uh, Mr. Turner too, uh, we are, we're going to look at our taxes that we've failed to do for years and years and years. And we're going to uh, hire a company. We're going to pay them $2.7 million. My only problem with the paying the $2.7 million, we've got 32 employees in the tax department. I'd like to know what we're going to do with those people because these people are going to be doing all the evaluations for residential and commercial and forums, I assume. Uh, I think this is a good idea for a one-shot deal. I think it gives you three years to get an opportunity to hire some qualified people in there as appraisers, certified commercial appraisers, not somebody the state says can do appraisals, but a licensed certified commercial appraiser, and also probably two of them. Uh, this has been uh, quite a fight, and uh, we, uh, we, we, I think we won. I think, uh, you know, we, we, we primarily proved to the county that the tax situation in this county is a mess. And it, it's, it's not going to get straightened out until we get the right people in the right, right positions. Uh, the other thing I'm going to talk a little minute about is about this courthouse construction. You're hiring a construction supervisor, is that correct? Or talking about hiring a construction director or supervisor which is actually over the company that you're hiring to be the construction company. In my experience, construction supervisors are a total waste of money because if you hire the contractor he bids, he's got to be present you a performance bond to guarantee that the work will be done. And if it's not done, then you file a claim against the performance bond. These bonds are very expensive. He makes sure all his subs are, have, are bonded. And that's presented in the bid. And the better quality of company, the lower the bond rates, which makes them more competitive. So to hire somebody to look over somebody that you already have looking over the project is totally, and I've talked with some big construction companies about this, and they're never used. They're never doing it. They just say it's a waste of money. So it may be something you want to think about and really look into because if you're going to get bids, you're going to require all these companies to provide performance bonds. And should they go broke during this project, that bond's going to pick up by the insurance company and pay to finish the project. So there's no worry there. It's insurance to make sure this gets done. So that's something you want to think about. Save some taxpayer money. Thanks, sir. Mr. Chandler, and let me remind everybody, um, Henry Chandler. Yes, yes, sir. Come on up. Okay. Um, remind everybody that commissioners have a commissioner's comment period after at the end of the meeting. Thanks, sir. Um, and we'll often comment about the public speakers and things of that sort. Yes, sir. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Henry Chandler, live at Lewis Graham Road in the McCray community. I'm addressing this board as a follow-up to the proposal from the Alamance County Planning Department to increase lot sizes in the rural areas from 30,000 square feet to 65,000 square feet, which I do support. I listened to those that opposed it, and I believe all but one was in the building trade. Two of them said the planning board is pushing a personal agenda. I attend many of those meetings, and that's just not the case. Besides, how does nine people from various parts of the county and backgrounds push a personal agenda. It's not possible. You certainly heard a personal agenda on this topic, and they were from the individual contractors. The more houses they pack in a piece of property, the more revenue it generates for them, and they have a right to speak. The envelope just given to you contains pictures and a GIF data of a relatively new development in northern Alamance County. Please notice the large variance in property sizes of the surrounding lots that I did not mark. This development sticks out like a sore thumb. 
Please note one picture where I circled the wells of two neighboring houses. It appears that these neighbors are drinking from the same dipper, so to speak. All the wells in this development are in the front yard and septic in the back. What happens if a homeowner has to dig a new well? This can happen because it, I personally experienced that myself. You don't move over just five feet when you dig, dig a new well, and when a well is dug, when a well is approved for someone in that development, the, the rig is gonna be in somebody else's property at the time they dig the well. Um, will, and will permission be granted if they do that? Two homes have experienced septic tank failures, field failures. Will, what happens if more repair is needed? Please also note the large variance of assessed value for the first three properties I have marked. I found it interesting, but assume it meets our tax code. You may think these lot sizes, these lots are 30,000 square feet, but they're not. They're one acre lots. They're one acre lots you're looking at. Is this what you want Alamance, rural Alamance County to look like? I certainly don't. I wanted you to see the actual data and pictures of what I'm speaking of and hear from another person that supports this plan from the planning board to increase the lot sizes from six to 65,000 square feet and also recommend a wider minimum width of the lot to, to avoid some of these problems that I'm seeing. Now I heard the commissioners and I've heard this from the planning board too a concern about affordable housing. I don't even know how you define that now. The county commissioners do not have the power to fix that. It's a national problem. But I appreciate you thinking about it, but it, it is something you can't fix. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Roxanne May. I like the fact that all of your speakers are right on the end, easy to get out. My name is Roxanne May, and I live in Burlington, North Carolina. I just want to start off by saying thank you for letting me be here and be able to speak. Let's just go ahead and say what needs to be said. Kids should be taught the positive aspect of competition. Why are y'all trying to take the competitive sport, take out competitive sports? No umps, no refs. Make it make sense. It's okay to be competitive. It's okay to fight for a spot on the team. It's okay to fight for a trophy. Participation trophies should stop being handed out around the age of seven or eight, in my opinion. Not everyone deserves a trophy. You are literally setting the kids up for failure by always giving them an award, but not working hard for it and never giving up. Always giving them an award for just showing up but but not making them earn it how is that going to help them in their adult lives it's literally teaching them that they don't have to work for nothing it just gets handed to them you and i both know that's not how the cookie crumbles that's not how life goes i bet every single one of us in here watches competitive sports our kids are the future in those sports but they won't have no choice or chance if you keep trying to sissify everything. They are a lot of, there are a lot of great points in competitive sports that go far and beyond that playful hits and yelling or the three point shots and home run hits. It's life skills that they will take for, with them forever. For example, there are a lot of disagreements about whether or not young children should play football. As a mother, it is hard to watch my baby get tackled and piled on top of and hearing the coaches yelling at him. However, there are some great lessons learned from playing football, basketball, baseball, etc. that go far beyond the hits, the touchdown, the home runs, the game-winning three-point shot. These kids are learning life skills that can use, they can use the rest of their lives. For example, social skills, competitive skills, sportsmanship, sportsmanlike, and leadership. Y'all are trying to have sports with no refs or umps. Those are the people on the fields and courts who tells the kids when they mess up or do wrong so they know they have to correct themselves. How are they supposed to know when they are doing wrong when they don't have the correct people, umps and refs, telling them they are doing so during a game. We was told that they would have one head coach in basketball and it would be played in pods and they would basically be the refs of the team, of the games. Tell me how that's going to work. How is it going to be fair calls? How are they going to be not be biased towards one team or the other? Y'all are literally going to push everyone out just like y'all already have to other teams. Um, so I'm just here speaking on the, the part where Competitive sports are getting kind of shoved to the side, and everybody's saying, here's a participation trophy. You done good. You don't have to work for anything. 
competitive sports teach you those things, teach you you have to work and you have to fight and you just never give up on what you want in life. And competitive sports teach you that. All these NFL players and stuff, I guarantee you half of them didn't get participation trophies. I know they went out and worked their butts off. And once y'all take that from them, y'all are taking it away, all of it. Thank you. Thank you. Henry Wood. <laughs> Good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Henry Vines. I live 3450 Isaac Drive, Snow Camp. Commissioners, I just uh, came tonight. I wanted to, a couple of things I wanted to address. Uh, as Mr. Chandler said, uh, I was really disappointed that uh, there wasn't some action taken on the acre and a half. But I do feel like that I, there was a lot of positive talk that we need to do something in this county about the growth. I keep hearing from each and every one of you how fast Alamance County is growing. It's growing. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when are we going to start making some positive actions to develop this growth, to plan this growth, where it needs to be and how it needs to be? When are we going to do that? I know everybody hates the word zoning. I know it. But is something this county needs. We have left our rural roots. We're headed into an industrial county. And if we don't start planning for this, I don't know where we're going to be. Also, the other thing I'd like to speak to is about the revalve and putting this out for bid, putting this out for a private company. $2.7 million, I thought it was 2.6, but anyhow, uh, cost us a million, cost us a million dollars uh, roughly to do this last one. I know that there has been, all or supposed to have been, uh, evaluations that were visited to every parcel of land in this county. It was, it was supposed to have been done we paid a company to do it, and and uh, it wasn't done. This was during the Kim Horton era. I was very much a part of that because it, it was just out of shape. We had all these appeals that came in because the, the, the valuations were just horrendous. So commissioners, I would just say that we need to keep our staff here so that we have appraisers here in the county to do the jobs that needs to be done here and that we can do these revals every four years ourselves. And I'm sure y'all explain a lot of things tonight, but that does $2.7 million, does it cover into another year of uh, coming to the Board of Equalization and Appeals? Does that, is that included in that part? Uh, and also it was said in the thing that there was three years. We have two years and three months before this thing is due. Not three years. And that's, that's, a, big, that's a big deal that we need to address. Appreciate it. Thank you for letting me talk. And we thank you. This is the last of the speakers, but I would encourage all four speakers to hang around. This meeting is... Uh, addressing each and every of your concerns of oh, each speaker. Okay. Consent agenda, do we have a motion? Motion to approve. A motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Has unanimous. The lady in the very back. <laughs> uh, Ma'am, what you spoke about will be addressed right now. Ms. Merkel is a wonderful director of recreation and parks. Thank you. 
and while she's getting ready to speak, she and her department worked massive overtime this weekend and put on a wonderful uh, hot air balloon show, a uh, car show, what all, music. Yeah, Alcavets had a very, despite the weather again, I think Alcavets had a successful event with all of the, uh, the offerings that they have. Um, we would like for one year for them to have much better weather. So hopefully that year is coming. <laughs> well, I'm not sure why they do it during hurricane season anyway. <laughs> I, I know they definitely try to tie it to 9-11 and uh, military. So, but maybe, maybe that's worth considering looking into another option. Well, we thank you and your support. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for having us back today um, to follow up on this subject. With me today, I have Jason Witherspoon, who is our program superintendent, and Gil Johnson, who is our athletic director within Alamance Parks. So before we talk about um, any other sports, I want to give an update on youth football, the youth tackle football. So youth tackle football season is going to stay as is. With the five organizations that are participating, they will play a four-game regular season where everybody plays each other once with a um, postseason playoffs and championship game, which will be a, a uh, guaranteed six-game season for those teams. Now, the three clubs that are run independently of the municipalities, so like we said before, we have three um, athletic clubs that are run through Civitan groups or athletic groups. And then we have the two municipalities. We have the city of Mebane and the city of Gibsonville that participate. So the three clubs have agreed to um, get together later this week to talk about playing each other again after the season to get a couple more games in. So I think they have a meeting set up for Wednesday where they're going to come to our offices and sit down and, and try to figure out what that looks like. Okay. Um, youth tackle football as a whole will continue as a team entry club sport that is done in a collaborative way between the club organizations that are involved by way of, of being represented by our department and then the, whatever municipalities still offer tackle football. And as long as those teams still want to play and still want to play each other, that, that league will continue. We'll keep tweaking it and do what we have to do so that it's successful, but that league is, is not going anywhere. So I just want to clear that up for everybody who was thinking that tackle football was going away, that it's not going away, it's not being replaced by flag football. It will continue, but we're trying to make efforts to make it um, as strong as possible so that it, it doesn't disappear. And trying to get the groups to work together, have it be more of a collaborative than a the county and one person from the county runs the whole league, if that makes sense. Okay. Are there any questions about tackle football before I continue? I guess you're the only ones who can ask, ask, ask questions right now. <laughs> okay. So that brings me to the presentation on the other sports. So the other sports that we historically offered as team entry um, club leagues organized by the county are basketball, baseball, and softball. These sports um, were run similar to football in the past where there were team entry and the county simply organized the schedules, the officials, and um, administrative stuff. Now, that was all prior to 2008. Due to many factors, these sports transi transitioned a few different times between 2008 and 2018 to a more traditional recreation model that we have today. And then there is still club participation, um, more so in baseball than basketball, but there is some club participation still. So what is the change that we are making now and why? So it really boils down to, to four reasons why. Number one factor is drop in participation. When you look at it, and I'll have some slides here to show you in a second, both on an organizational level and on an individual level, we have had a steep decline in participation over the last two decades. Based on those numbers and feedback that we have gotten, we're not meeting the needs of the majority of families. In researching our trends, in participation, we also see that the most underserved community or population within our programs are girls in this county. Last year, 2023, there were only 185 girls participating in any of our athletic programs. And then finally, space. 
we have the space that we have through the agreements that we have with ABSS and um, through the two community centers that we operate, which are also a lease through ABSS. And competing for that space is always a challenge. So in the slides that I brought today to try to paint that picture a little bit more for you. Um, the first one, do I have control of this? Yes, awesome. <laughs> so the first one here, this is numbers. Boring, but it's numbers. So this is showing you the total participation individuals in the sports that the county has historically offered, kind of broken down in, into decades and then the last few years. So you can see we quickly went from 23, 24% of the pop of the youth population of Alamance County participating in some way through a county sponsored program to in 2010, that dropped drastically to 9%. 2022, 4%. And I don't have the total numbers for 23 and 24, but as you can see, the participation numbers keep going down and we know this county is growing. There's a multitude of factors as to why this is a case that I will need another couple hours to sit down and explain. But that is the reality that we are faced with and that we are trying to adjust to solve. Now looking at organizational participation, this is what baseball looked like in the 90s and early 2000s. The, this is the number of organizations that was participating at some point in the, base, the baseball program that the county offered. These were churches, club organizations, Civitan organizations, City of Mebbin, City of Graham, Haw River, Swepsonville. This is what it looks like now, okay? We have three strong clubs still going in the county. Hoffield Civitan, Alamance Civitan, and Northern Alamance Athletic Club. So for baseball, we work in conjunction with them, but in a more recreational model. This is what basketball looked like in the 90s and early 2000s. This is what it looks like now. Now this one's a little different. Two of those balls represent clubs that are still partially involved in the basketball program. And then the other two are the community centers, the teams that we, we run out of the community centers in Pleasant Grove and Eli Whitney. And then finally, this was football. At some point, this was different football organizations that had teams, including other municipalities and other clubs. And then as we all know, we're down to five now. So that, I just wanted to explain that and make that clear so that as we talk about our proposal and what we're planning to do, you see what we're faced with and what we're trying to solve. So the new format in which we'll offer through Alamance Athletics, which we've, we have branded it, um, treats each of the county recreation facilities as its own community rec center. Each will serve as a central hub for community-based recreation sports. It is our team's professional opinion that this plan meets the goals that we have as a department, addresses the challenges that we're facing, and then maximizes the use of the facilities that we are investing in, that you are investing in. Okay. This plan was vetted through our Parks and Rec Advisory Board in the spring, and it was um, voted on by them for us to move forward with it. So I just wanted to make that clear as well. So now that you kind of have the background and the history of it, I want to turn it over to Gil Johnson. He's our athletic director who's going to talk to you a little bit more about what the program looks like. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Commissioner. Thank you all for having us today. Um, I'm going to be going over uh, essentially what this program looks like. I know there's been a lot of um, misinformation about it's just kids playing on a ball field, but um, this is a very structured program, and we're excited to share with you guys. Uh, with this program, we're hoping to address, uh, Jamie mentioned about four reasons why our program looks the way it does today. Um, I'll be addressing really two factors that we've noticed through surveys that we send out to parents, conversations we have with families that participate in our programs, and also ones who don't, who don't um, while we believe the participation numbers are so low. Um, two of those issues is the lack of variety. Um, if you just watch the Olympics or you watch TV, you go to any high school, there are so many sports out there. There's, I think the last time I looked, there's about 120 sports in the country that we play and we offer <clears throat> essentially three. Um, so people are different. You might have someone who wants to do dance, martial arts, 
football, basketball, baseball. Um, some some kids specialize in those things, but a lot of kids are just looking for that thing that they really care about. And sometimes it's not the three things that we offer. Um, so we just notice that low participation numbers due to the lack of uh, variety is a factor. Um, and the second one is time. Um, so that really splits into two, two factors. So in county ball, um, which I'm referencing our traditional model, um, you saw in the past slides, I'll go to uh, there. I'll just use football, for example. When we had multiple teams, you could have northern divisions, southern divisions, eastern divisions, western divisions. You didn't have to travel all over the county as if you do today to where you can tell there's huge gaps. Um, going back to basketball, tons of teams. You were driving five minutes to another gym, ten minutes to another gym. Every week you're driving, I think, uh, the variety in some of these or the distance between some of the gyms is 30, 45 minutes to maybe at Eli Whitney to AO. It's a long drive, especially for someone who lives on the outskirts of the county, having to drive to a 6 o'clock game at AO Elementary School. It's tough. We have a lot of folks who um, commute Greensboro, Raleigh, Chapel Hill. Um, it's hard to get to those games. So some families just say, we just can't make it work, unfortunately. Um, the other side of that is uh, we're competing with busy schedules. Um, families, I mean, I, I know my family, we have two little boys. They have something every night. We have church. We've got work. We've got um, hobbies. We have friends. We have a lot of things that we are competing with. And so when we don't offer variety and we're not flexible with schedules, whether that's offering baseball in the fall, offering baseball in the spring, offering flag football in the spring, offering tackle football in the fall, um, we don't give a lot of flexibility to those families that are just we're competing with, you know, can they, can they give us – two nights a week, can they give us three nights a week? A lot of families, as we see, aren't able to do that. So those are, those are two, time and the uh, lack of variety are two of the main uh, issues that we have. Um, so we hope to um, uh, find solutions for that through this new model. Um, so through uh, fixing the lack of variety, uh, as you can see in this model, um, this is just kind of a brief example. This isn't necessarily what we are set on for this upcoming year, but we want to do a lot of things. So the, the term is called sports sampling. Sports sampling is where you have a lot of offerings and you don't have the lengthy commitments. So traditionally, if you play baseball or basketball, that's a four-month commitment, whether that's Saturdays or weeknights. Um, that's a tough thing for families to do. So what we want to be able to do is say, hey, let's offer a lot of stuff in a shorter amount of time, if a kid likes it, great, pursue it more. If we see that a smaller sample of uh, kids really enjoy a program, we can offer it more. We can point them in direction of maybe your, maybe your skill is better than some of the other kids. What are, what are the other offerings there? Um, so we just need to help kids find uh, what they're good at, what they enjoy. Uh, for addressing the, the situations, the, the issues of time, uh, travel time across the county is difficult, and it's, it's just tough to do when you're expected to drive 75% of your games across the county. So we, as Jamie said, we want to treat our, our community centers as kind of that hub where you're going to be playing uh, the majority of your, your games and your practices to where you're cutting down on travel time. Uh, you live next to a gym, you know, I know where that gym is, I know the community, I know who's going to be at the gym. Um, so just, just being able to prevent the, I've got to be at Eli, let's just say you live at Pleasant Grove, I've got to be at Eli Whitney at six, or I've got to be there for a seven o'clock game, game runs till eight, you're not getting home on a school night until 9.30, 10 o'clock. It's tough for a lot of these families. Um, so we hope to cut down on that. Uh, the traditional model that we have now, as far as where you play, uh, where you practice, where you have games, depends on how many teams we have. Um, so this new model allows you to uh, select your set location. So if you live next to AO, it might say 8U Boys Basketball at AO on these nights. So you know ahead of time when you're going to be playing. Now it is you sign up, depending on how many teams we have and where they are, well, you're not going to find out your team assignment, your game schedule, your practice schedule until after you've signed up, until registration closes. And that's tough for a lot of families to commit registration fees or just to wait to find out, oh, we can't do Wednesday nights, we do church, or we, the parents have to work on the weekend. So that's, that's just a tough thing to do. So we hope by being uh, forward with the schedules that parents are able to sign up confident that it works for their family. Um, so, you know, what does this look like, right? So I know we talk about we have the sports. So what does it look like to sign up and participate? Um, so 
to make sure that we're able to have essentially a baseline or to make sure all kids have equal opportunities to um, learn a skill, we will be working on creating curriculums for all these sports. Uh, we call them program plans. Essentially, as an instructor, as a coach, as a staff person, you are able to open a binder and say, week one, the kids should be learning these skills this week. Um, here's an appendix, here's a bunch of examples, here's some games you can play, here's some drills you can teach, um, to where we know every kid in the county is gonna have the same experience, um, which is great. It's, it's, it's kind of a quality control thing, but really we want kids to make sure that they're all having the same experience, a good experience. Um, so uh, for the first three weeks, of, of the, ba I'll use basketball as an example. Uh, the first three, three weeks of practices, first three weeks of the program will be practices where the kids will learn competitive drills, uh, strategize, learn basketball knowledge and terminology. After the three weeks, kids will start playing games at the gyms that they practice at. So again, no longer traveling across county to make game times. Um, games will be officiated, uh, score will be kept, and games will, will result in a winner and a loser. We believe sports are competitive. There should be a winner and a loser at the, each of, at, the each, at the end of each competition. We're not disputing that. Um, it's an important part of it, but it shouldn't be the main thing that we're focused on. <coughs> Shoot. Um, the head basketball instructor will have the discretion week by week to mix up the teams to encourage parity and to spur on more competitive games. Um, we saw in our pilot program, we ran this model of basketball um, at Pleasant Grove and at Eli Whitney, we saw that the games were more competitive, there were more buzzer beaters by the end of the season because every week you're able to say, okay, this game was about 10 points difference. We know who the, the skilled kids are, who works well together. By the end of the season, games are competitive until the very end. And that's what we want to have. The competition is at the game and not so much focus outside of the court or outside of the field. Um, parents still have the opportunities to volunteer as coaches and other supportive roles with their groups. So just to, just to go back to sports sampling real fast, um, our goal is to offer more than just the three traditional sports that we currently offer. Uh, right now we're offering uh, sports like introduction to sports programs for preschoolers, that's my favorite. Um, we are offering volleyball, we'd like to offer flag football, indoor soccer, disc golf, and that's just to name a few. Uh, if there's a sport that a kid wants to try and then we want to be the ones to offer it. I mean, it's nothing's better than hearing from the people um, that you're providing a service for and being able to say, hey, I can, I, we can meet that need, whether it's just providing the space or purchasing or renting equipment for them to, to participate. Um, so just real quick, some of the statistics from the fall signups that, we've, that we have so far. Um, so normally when we'd be just focusing on tackle football, uh, we don't have anything else in the fall, it's just tackle football. Uh, we've had over 100 kids sign up for our fall programs. So that is our intro to sports programs, uh, volleyball, kickball, uh, and just a couple other programs. Um, so by having over 100 kids, that's an increase of 15% already to our total numbers for, for the year. Um, as Jamie mentioned, we are failing young girls in this community by not offering what either what they want or, or making it available to them. Um, so. And, and good news, uh, we have increased that statistic by 30% already, and that's just this fall. Uh, we are offering volleyball at AO, intro to sports classes, some of these other sports as well that um, they're signing up for. And out of that 30% increase, 80% of those girls have never played with the county before. So that is someone we can go look at a registration system and show there's no history of them playing softball, basketball, or any other program with us. So we're, we're offering attractive programs to bring people in and hopefully build that trust to where they're signing up for multiple things. Um, so to, to sum up, uh, our department believes that this is the way forward and revitalizing our youth athletics program. Uh, we see this model driving the most participation uh, by meeting families where they are uh, with convenient youth athletics programs. So I uh, thank you, sorry I rambled a little bit. Uh, thank you all so much for having us and we're here to answer any questions y'all have. Thank you. Mr. Carter, questions? Mm. Mr. Carter. Oh, well, I, I will say I'm oh, impressed. I was winding up, but go ahead. You see me? Mr. Carter, go ahead, please. <laughs> oh, okay. Hit us with it, come on. Um, <laughs> So, uh, new program is, programming is great. Uh, I'd like to concentrate though on the on the existing football, baseball, basketball students, kids. Yep. So, <clears throat> this new program program goes into effect 
It's already in effect. So, but so yeah. This so, season. in conjunction with tackle football this yeah, fall, we decided we did roll a few out. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we know the the status of football. Mm-hmm. Yep. But for baseball and softball, when? So basketball right. registration is open now. Oh yeah. So so is it changing the registration for basketball? It just opened. Just opened. Yeah. Okay. If if we have a situation where you know, folks who currently play don't like this new format, and so our numbers go down, and so we don't have enough teams in each of these locations. Is there a backup plan? Well, one of the good things about the way we are structuring it as the community-based programs now is no matter how many sign up, even if we don't get 20 kids yeah. sign up, we can adopt it. So if we get 10 kids that sign up, we can still have a basketball program. If we get, would you abandon the the location model at that point, or w- because then you wouldn't have enough kids but to play two teams, I guess. Well, there, that those would that group is the teams. Even if we get all twenty to sign up in in a sign up, that group is the teams. The teams are broken up week after week. This is very similar to a model that they went to in Burlington last year. Um, it's called uh, tip off, tip off. Tip off. So this is how the city of Burlington runs their basketball programs. It's how Mebbin um, runs their lacrosse and flag football programs, where you're not signing up for an individual team. You're signing up to play with this group of people, and after the first three weeks, every week you'll be broken up into teams, and it may it, it'll change each week. That's not true for football, though. No, football is staying as a team entry <clears throat> club sport. What about baseball and softball? Is it like football or is it like No, it, baseball, softball, and basketball would, would roll into this new offering because that's where we're seeing the most drastic drops. So when is the sign-up for baseball, softball? Baseball would be, I'll let you last that. We would probably start sign-ups for that in late January, early February. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, are you also having success with getting coaches under this new model? Okay, I'm going to let you guys address that one. Because yeah. that's a fundamental change for what a coach yeah. Yeah. does. So we're still really early on because, again, where we normally would be focusing on football. Am I talking into it? I apologize. Um, yeah, so so great example. Thank you. Uh, we have um, – figuring out what your community wants is a huge part of this. So uh, the idea was what can we offer for girls? I knew in the area several volleyball coaches. I reached out to one of them in particular over at AO for Western area. She thought it was a great idea. Now we are over capacity in volleyball. We have a wait list for volleyball. So being able to find high school instructors, high school coaches, parents who are adamant about doing this. I mean, volleyball is a great example. Um, Because we've gone over that number, she was able to recruit another volleyball coach that she knows to where now we can offer more than the 50. It was going to be a pot of 15. Now it's up to 25. We're having talks about bumping it up to 30, 35 kids. Um, so it's just about recruiting, get it in the schools, get it out in the community. Again, it was kind of a soft opening, soft rollout with this program. Um, but with I think when we start getting momentum, having people see that this is something they would want to continue to do, hopefully that volleyball coach is signing up for – doing three or four sessions a year. Hopefully they know somebody who wants to coach as well. I guess it's foreseeable. Let's take basketball. You could have a lot of people that want to sign up at AO who would go to AO, but not many, and I'm just picking something Pleasant Grove. Sure. Um, If that's the case, can folks who would be assigned to Pleasant Grove move over to AO? There's a lot of flexibility with it. And can you pick? Can you say, well, I live in Burlington, but I really want to play with the, my folks down yeah. in Cedar Rock it's, Park? Yeah, it's totally, it's totally, we don't have like a, you, if you live next to AO, you have to do it. So part of the signups for this is we strategically said, traditionally basketball for boys, games are Mondays and Wednesdays. There's a lot of folks who that just doesn't work for them, so they just don't sign up. So if for our Northern Division, basketball signups for AO might be Monday and Wednesday nights at Pleasant Grove, which is our other Northern Division, is on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So... If t- Mondays and Wednesdays work, then great. If they don't work, try Tuesdays and Thursdays, 15 minutes down the road. Could they do both? They could do both. All right. You can have somebody play four nights of basketball, or in this model, they could do basketball on Mondays and Wednesdays, volleyball on Thursdays, kickball on Saturday. You know, there's, there's options to get your kid out of the house every night of the okay. week. In this. And I, I said Cedar Rock Park, but I noticed obviously there's no gym in Cedar Rock Park, so there, that's there, not a basketball option. It's that. not a basketball option, okay. but there is options because of some of the field space. So disc golf, ultimate frisbee, vol- beach volleyball. There's a small basketball court out there, but um, there's a lot of options for programming out at Cedar Rock because of the space. Okay. Cross so the, country, yeah. The overall goal would be to increase the number of people who play yes. all of these sports. Absolutely. Okay, we'll see mm-hmm. if it works. 
Ms. Thompson. Um, you just made a point. You said that they could possibly be playing every night of the week. <clears throat> but you also just said that they were having trouble because they were getting home late and they were not being... I, I lived in Snow Camp. Eli Whitney played AO in middle school basketball, and we thought we were in another state <laughs> because it was so far to go. But we also thought we was hot stuff because we were traveling that far to go play. And then we ended up going to high school together and making one team. Um, is, it, is it the travel sports that's killing us? Is that what it is? Because my daughter played high school and travel. And it, I'm telling you, I had to sell my kidney. It was so expensive. It, it's a variety of factors. <laughs> it's not just travel sports, but yes, travel sports is a big part of it. Because if you look at the years when our stuff started dropping and you coincide it with when travel sports and AAU really took off, there's correlation there. There's definitely correlation there. And that's got a lot to do with what Roxanne was talking about, about competition, mm -hmm. because people crave that more competitive. Kids don't mind getting hurt. They love to go to school. Look at my eye. I mean, I'm telling you, it's, <coughs> it's a big deal. Yeah. And, and I mean, there's a place in this world for, for it all. <coughs> as a Parks and Recreation Department, we want to serve as many <coughs> members of the community as possible. And our goals as a department, <coughs> while competitive sports teaches everything that we've listed off, we agree with that wholeheartedly. <coughs> but we <Thomas>. feel, yeah, <laughs> he's passed it on to you. But <coughs> to maximize participation, we feel with the facilities that we have and the programs we have to offer that this, this is what's going to increase okay. participation. <coughs> Do we no longer have church leagues? Uh, well, church, churches, you know about this. Because we, we did upwards basketball. Uh, still upwards. Okay, and we also did soccer. They ain't this yeah. tall, but they got that shirt on. They're the cutest yeah. things you've ever seen. They go everywhere except where they're supposed to. But that's the whole point of it. Yeah, so one of the big changes, as, as Jamie was saying, is through time, different organizations, private organizations, um, have begun to uh, to cater to niche, very specific requests. Travel ball, high competition, bigger threshold, uh, the cost for entry is much higher. Um, churches in our area have adopted an upward model, which is, again, all the, the same heart is there is to lower the threshold so that we're saying yes to more kids. And it's not as intimidating to be on the same kid with the kid that plays travel ball and who can, you know, dribble everywhere around the court and nobody can get him with the kid that just wants to play with his friends who's not at that level yet. Well, I know upwards that our church was a real outreach ministry, but don't think that Baptists don't get crazy <laughs> with their children. If you got LeBron James playing me, they going after both of us. I as, mean, as a graduate of a Southern Baptist seminary, I can agree with you. You're right. <laughs> the best fights you'll ever see. So I'm just, and I just think about how this, I hear you talking about all these different things. Is that going to be cost effective? Are you going to have to have one person for archery, one person for volleyball? And I mean, you talked about high school things. Uh, are these kids vetted? I mean, we got to look under every rock for everybody that's going to be in the vicinity of a child. Yeah, so that's one of the things that we're looking forward to as getting volunteerism, as we all know, has, has been trending down for a long time. And that is true in youth athletics as well, is oftentimes we are waiting to the last second to find a volunteer for a, a, a team that we've already, Gil has put the team together and... We've got no volunteers, so it begins the search of reaching out to the parents of that team. Anybody interested in, in, in coaching, we need, we need a coach, and nobody, nobody, nobody. Until the last second, that parent that really wants their kid to play says, I'll do it. Never done it before. And then we have usually a day or two to get them ready to be on the court with a bunch of kids. And they're there for the right reasons which makes a huge difference. We do their background checks, all that kind of stuff. But that just-in-time training is not quite an, it's not the, the goal that we want to set out there. And so in this new model, we will use um, uh, part-time employees and contract employees. Uh, very uh, similar to Gil was talking about with volleyball success there, a Burlington uh, ABSS employee 
uh, gym teacher who has the skill set. Huh. Let me know how that works for you. Mm -hmm. um, how much is they? Since they make so much money, let me know how it works for you. So that's how I've done uh, with archery. Again, it was grunt work. It was me getting that started. And then I found competent instructors that we use as contract employees yeah. to facilitate that now. Well, and one more question. I went out to Hallfields, which was like the Kansas City Chiefs practice. I've never seen so many kids. Their, pack, their, their shoulders and their helmets are bigger than they are. It was the cutest thing I've ever seen. And they were sweating and just working. And you have like all of these moms. Nobody better ever try to talk their child the wrong way. And then over here I had cheerleaders who were doing this. It was the most active community scene I've seen. And that's what you want for every. And I know this the same way at him. I know it's the other places the same way. And it, it um, I want I want kids to walk that path just like when they graduate. It's got to be their path. But I just don't want us to. Um, not look at recreation parks as a valued thing for us to fund properly in our budget to make sure kids have those choices. And it's still up to the parents to get them there because third graders that are late for school didn't drive. So, and parents are swamped. Some parents are working two jobs because of the economy. That's where your volunteers are going to crash because they just can't, not that they don't want to. So I, I just, um, I just want to make sure that we're really there for our kids because um, we've seen some really tough situations and maybe if those kids would have had these opportunities in a supportive home and set of parents, that would have been such a different story because you read all the time about the pros talk about what their moms did and what their dads did and how they just put that so important to give them a chance to get out of where they were because it all does start at the home and the home walks into the school building. So uh, I'm just a huge supporter of sports. I played it all my life, and um, it's just it's just the best thing a kid can do. But it's still up to them. You can't make a kid want to do that. They've got their own interests, and they need to have that opportunity too. So um, I just don't want to see nothing take away from what's going on with our football and our basketball, because they've worked a lot of hard hours. These guys and girls that volunteer and work for this in the community. I've met several of them, and I don't want us to cut them short for anything because I know the background history of that, and um, we just need to keep a balance on all of it. But I like the difference if that's what kids want to do, but don't break it if it ain't broke, so to speak. Um, I just want to make sure we support what's going strong and, and enforce that, and I know you guys do too. Mr. Wife. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I want to thank Jamie and, and Gil and Jason for coming tonight. I have a lot of respect for you folks. I know you're always looking at how you can make the Parks and Recs, Alamance County Parks and Recs, better than it, it is. Um, I'm just going to say this because I think that I actually believe that participation for kids in our county are actually up. But the reason why we probably don't have as many people in the county league is because there are so many other options. You have the Graham, you have Mebane, you have Burlington, and you have these travel teams. I, my, my niece plays on a travel team. She's someplace all over. The, and if she wasn't playing with a travel team, she would be in a Alamance County softball league. So you guys have a lot of stuff that you're, you're juggling to try because the competitions that that I believe that looking at your numbers participation in the county got to a peak in like 2020 uh, 2010 and then the last 13 years we've tailed off considerably and that's where we've had all the competition from from various entities like the uh, you name it so it's a uh, it's you have a difficult job but I think it's something that we um, as a county should actually stay stay engaged and we're, we're glad that you folks are doing this for us. Thank you. Ms. Carr. Well, you not only have the travel teams, I, I, I agree with what we what you've been hearing. I mean, we have a lot of competition for county parks programs. And, uh, I mean, I don't get to see all the churches in the county by any stretch of the imagination, but just about every one I've been in so far has its own gymnasium that has a regulation basketball court in it. So, uh, uh, you know, you've got, I mean, but not only basketball, volleyball, kickball, all sorts of things going on in those gymnasiums to a 
dealing with kids during the week that uh, the churches are putting on. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that are creating competition for the parks. But that's all good news. I mean, if, if, if kids have an opportunity to get involved in something that is productive and builds character, strength, and activity to keep them healthy, those are all good things. But we, we're just one piece of it. It, it takes all of us to make it work. Uh, we just got to do the best job we can for the ones that can't get to something else. Yeah. Agreed. I additionally want to thank not only the three of you guys, but everybody at Recreation and Parks. Uh, just doing a super job. Thank you. I have a granddaughter that's now mid-20s that played junior Olympic volleyball. And I'll give you her, and if you tell her I told you to call, uh, I will have to deny that. <laughs> it could be, potentially be a great coach. Unfortunately, it's on video. <laughs> <laughs> We're holding you to that now. I think that was denial is not an option, John. I, I, think, I think she and I have both had already been doing that. <laughs> uh, but you're right. There's so much competition now. Uh, my grandson played <coughs> in the gym at your church, Ms. Thompson Upward. and Mr. Carter. Um, Do we convert him? Is he Baptist now? <laughs> no. <laughs> they, they didn't convert him from Presbyterian, <laughs> but he played basketball you, there. You may not know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, he just passed the war exam. Oh, congratulations. So, uh, you notified this past week. So you did a good job, whatever you did. <laughs> Uh, Does he coach anything, too? <laughs> <laughs> now, having said that, um, is it possible to get more information, and this is a question for you guys and staff as well, to get more information out at the beginning of the school year about Alamance County Recreation and the programs that we're running, and there, therefore have potentially more teams uh, and more opportunities. Uh, Ma'am, did they answer your questions? Would you stand and ask the questions? So with the pods, that's how basketball is being played, correct? So one coach is going to be at that game. So for AO, all them kids are going to be broken into pods and they're going to play against each other. And that one coach is going to be the rep over that, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can, I, yeah. So what that looks like, let's just use the number 20 Repeat kids. Repeat the question because it's not on the mic. Yeah, so she was one, correct me if I'm wrong, she was wondering what it would look like for that pot of kids to play in a game. What, what, who's doing what during the game, essentially? Yeah, like, so if there's 20 kids and you break them into four groups and they play against each other, mm -hmm. that one coach that is coaching all of them kids mm -hmm. is going to be the one that rests the game, correct? Mm-hmm. So how is that going to not be biased towards one side or the other? What if his kids play on this team but not on this team? How is one coach supposed to coach all them kids plus be the rest to all them teams? So we we same with baseball. Okay. So we feel like the training and everything behind what we're going to be doing and the vetting behind the coaches. I haven't really been at many games where there's that many biased people against kids, and it, and a lot of it the the sports speak themselves. Um. Now, I, I hear complaints about stuff like that, uh, but like in the game of baseball, there's not there's not a lot there that you can be biased for when a kid's pitching strikes or you're adapting a sport for kids. Um, so what there's opportunities for parents to be assistant coaches, to be bench coaches. Um, I'll just speak from uh, last year having center court. There wasn't a bias. I mean, there's no way to go. <coughs> I say there's no way, but there's not a high percentage chance of there being someone who's good. I'm gonna make sure my kids on the winning team. Because at the end of the day, are they playing for a championship at the end of the season? No, they're they're playing for the night. They're playing for the game itself, and not for all of these other things like records and championships. And but they are playing for who's going to win and lose that night. So with you say okay, so you said that y'all send out this survey or y'all ask parents about what they think about the sports and this and that. My kid has been playing for Alamance County, right? for going on five years now, and I've never gotten asked, and I've never gotten a letter. Um, but with that being said, you said that people don't 
know how to, I guess, if they're just now becoming a coach or something. My husband was never a coach. He got thrown into it because nobody else knew how to do it. And nobody else, I mean, the coach that was there didn't know what he was doing. So my husband looked it up on YouTube. He played football from 6 years old to 11th grade until he tore his rotating cuff. He looked up on YouTube. He done his experience from school, everything. <laughs> so me, I am a teen mom of football, never done it in my life, but I adapted to it. That's what they can do. That they can adapt to those things. Well, I'm just not understanding why it's being played in pods. So why can't you have the little pods over here for the ones that don't want the competitive, um, and then the ones who wants to be competitive have that for one. But for football, you play every game that you play in the regular season is on. You're going to be put on standings. What your standings is as of right now? We're number one in the standings because we beat Medvin finally after four years of trying. <laughs> We finally beat them. So we're at the top. At the end of the season, we have a championship we have to win. So each one of those games actually does. It isn't just for the night. It is for the season. So we're Ms. Merkel, let, in me, place. let me read her half this. Um, because unfortunately, we, we've got limited You're time. Fine. I apologize. Um, if you have enough sign-ups, can we still have the teams and also do these so that that was a question we expected to get this evening was how can we do both and this brings back the conversation of after school athletics and the reason yeah. we have not been able to institute an after school athletics program is because we haven't got the position for it okay and the funding so we could do both but not with our existing resources and the biggest competition in trying to do both is going to be field space. Somebody is going to have to compromise. Both parties, both programs are going to have to comp compromise on field and gym space. So that will probably be the biggest challenge followed by staffing. Now, if the club teams were to operate similar to football, where they field the teams, they find the coaches, and they do the bulk of the heavy lifting, like football. And again, football is not changing. So I know we keep still talking about football, That's but just one thing that yeah, I'm about. And my yeah. Son plays basketball and baseball yeah. Too. So if the clubs wanted to continue to have a more highly competitive, I guess that's how we're, we're calling a highly competitive league, where teams travel around the county and play each other, and we're putting the teams together, we're finding coaches, and we're doing all of the administrative side, we couldn't do both. Let me suggest this, um, and I appreciate your input. Um, if you reach the point that you have the sign-ups with enough kids, come back to us and ask for more resource, monies, whatever is needed. Um, and so, ma'am, Call your friends, your neighbors that have kids, and get more people to sign up so we can have different teams. Yeah, I'm so sure I'm, if I'm they challenge that you, to people, they I'm, would. Yeah, I'm going to challenge you to bring the numbers in so that they can come back to us and ask for more now, resources. Are you saying for them to sign up with the individual clubs? If you have enough to do individual clubs. At this point, you don't. You're down to 4% Correct. two years ago. Um, yeah, so I don't know that this lady or, and or her friends, I hope I'm wrong, I'm challenging you to get enough kids in to our county programs that we are, and I use the word force loosely, I know we won't be forced to, or encouraged to put more money into recreation and parks for these kids. So gather your troops, bring the kids in, sign them up, and then you guys come back to us, please. Fair enough. Thank you. Yep. And we thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Ma'am, you're challenged. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs>
Mr. Baker is complaining that I have not mentioned his name yet. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> before I, um, before we move off the recreation topic, I do just want to take a minute and recognize Dean Coleman uh, in the audience tonight, who was our first recreation and parks director and spent. I don't know. Saw with 30 years in that role, I think. Yeah. Um, so. And there's a little street name for him. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So thank you for being here. The um, name of the road going into Cedar Rock Park is named for this gentleman, and we really appreciate everything you've done for many, many, many years. It's my pleasure. Uh, commissioners, I'm before you again tonight to discuss uh, the delivery methods. Uh, for bidding out the construction for the new courthouse. Um, we have uh, discussed this topic uh, in, in some recent meetings, so I'm going to do a very brief overview of the various options available to us. Um, I also have uh, Andy Crookshank in uh, the audience. He's with CRA Architects, has helped design the courthouse with us, and has a lot more experience with these uh, bidding methods than I do. So if you ask me a question, I don't know the answer to, which won't be very hard. Uh, he'll be here to back up um, with some relevant information. So these are the three construction delivery methods that we as a county are authorized to use. Design, bid, build, construction manager at risk, and design, build. Uh, design, bid, build is our traditional model. We have an architect design the entirety of the project, uh, and he takes that out to market to find a construction company to build that for us. Um, there's benefits to that. We know how to do it. It's the way we've always done it. Unfortunately, we quite often run into a challenge where we don't know how much it's going to cost, really, until we get out to the market. So we've done this with the courthouse a couple times. We haven't gone all the way out uh, with a full design, but we design what we think we're going to need. We talk to all the parties, spend months doing that, pay the architect a significant amount of money for that design, and they come back, and the price is twice as much as we have available to us. Um, and it stops our projects dead in our tracks. We have to start over. We have to pay architect again. Um, so from a project of this size, I have some concerns about that traditional model. Um, the second option available is construction manager at risk. This is a much more collaborative model between the architect and the general contractor. So we choose a builder at the beginning of the process. We choose an architect at the beginning of the project. They work together throughout that process to the design the building that we want and the building that we can afford. So uh, our architect will bring back a design. We'll talk to the contractor about it, say, help us out with costs here. What's this going to be? If they're not in the realm of what we are willing to pay, we're able to make some adjustments in the design process, make it smaller, take out some fixtures, um, make it less fancy, do some things to get, get a handle on that cost. So it's a much more collaborative model. Um, and we know how much we're going to pay before the construction starts, immediately after the design finishes. Um, so that's the model I'm going to recommend for this project, and we'll talk through um, some of the reasons why as well. The third option is design build. Um, it is kind of a hybrid of those two. It's, it's very similar to the construction manager at risk. The difference is the designer and the contractor are the same party. So you're really just bidding out the entire project. I need someone to design this and build this. Um, they're the same party. We have one contract. So construction manager at risk, the county has a separate contract with an architect and with a contractor. So those are two contracts we have. The architect works for us in that scenario. Design build, it's one contract. We are hiring a team. Um, one downside is the architect doesn't work for us. The architect works for the general contractor. Um, so there's benefits to that. It's a great plan if you need to do something quickly um, and you need this, that process to move, the design process to move in tandem with the construction process. Um, but there are some downsides uh, with regard to, to that model as well. So the courthouse expansion um, has some unique factors to it, in particular is that we've been working with CRA on this project for about five years. So they've been with us since 2018. We started doing the surveys, we started talking to staff, starting to put together the multiple different plans we've had. Um, Andy's been on that team. 
um, and it would cost us a lot of time and money to switch architects now. Um, so we're happy with that. We would like to choose a bidding model that allows us to cho choose our own architects so that we could ensure that we can stay with CRA. The construction manager at risk allows us to do that. Um, the second big issue of this courthouse is that we've decided how much we're going to pay. So you guys have authorized the, the amount of money for this, and I really don't want to come back and ask you for more money. <laughs> um, and I'm sure that you don't want me to. So construction manager at risk gives us that ability to make sure we hit that financial target and that we're going to pay the amount of money that we've decided for this building and we'll adjust the design as we go um, in order to make sure that happens. Um, so the final reason here is that speed of construction is important. I know that we're all in a hurry to get this thing built relatively quickly. Uh, a construction manager at risk process and a design build process, they're both quicker than a traditional design bid build process because you're able to do those uh, the design and the build process a little more seamlessly. You don't only have to bid it out once at the beginning, so it's a little bit quicker. It's not drastically quicker. We're not gonna save two years here. It's still gonna take a while, um, but it's a little bit quicker. Um, so my recommendation for, for this process for the courthouse is construction manager at risk. Um, last thing, here's a couple other projects that are uh, similar that have been done with the construction manager at risk process. The most recent one, Forsyth County Courthouse, was CMR, uh, Buncombe County, and Cleveland County. Both chose to do theirs this way. Um, and I've included at the bottom of this slide some other projects that Andy and the team at CRA has worked on using a construction manager at risk process, just so you can see they have a lot of experience doing this. Um, and they, they can handle the difficulties of this process. So if you have any questions for me or, or for Andy, I'm sure we're happy to address those. Mr. General, I'll pick on you again first. <laughs> um, are there two bids? If we, if we go construction manager at risk, are there two bids that we get, one from the architect Ooh. and one from a potential GC? So they're not bids, it's a selection process, but we choose an architect and we choose a contractor separately. Um, and so, yeah, those things happen separately. Um, and one thing it's important to note is if we get through that process and we're not happy with it, we can always drop back and go to a design bid build. So if we start the <coughs> construction manager risk process, we get to a point where we're, it's just not working out with our contractor. We can quit that, we can drop back, we can bid out the design as a traditional method. And the selection process is based on what criteria? Qualifications and experience, so not price. They won't have priced anything. There's nothing to price at that point. We're, cho we're choosing folks that we want to work with, but they don't have a design yet, so we, they can't bid on anything. Might different general contractors make they know it's going to be a, so a specific amount of money to do a specific thing. Yes. How, how do different GCs make a decision to bid on this or not based upon? I mean, I guess the question is, you're selecting based on qualifications. We don't know how much the GC is going to make. The GCs bid <coughs> make a determination about how much they're going to make, right? Okay, I give up. <laughs> I'm wondering why. I'm wondering why a GC would bid. Sure, that sure. Or not? Or yes. choose not to bid. Um, so I just thank you, commissioners, for having me here today. This is a complicated series of discussions that you guys are having, and I applaud you for taking this on now and making these decisions early in the process. We really haven't even started design. Uh, we've been doing some studies with you. So you guys are ahead of the game here, and that's that's a good thing. Um, so to answer your question, why would a contractor be interested in doing CMR? Um, well, first of all, you got a very attractive project here. Um, and so I don't think you're going to have any shortage of interested, very talented, very good contractors that specialize and have actually had experience working on justice facilities, courthouse facilities. Um, that's the advantage, one of the advantages to CMR 
is you're going to be able to choose a contractor based on their depth of experience rather than just taking the low bidder who could be somebody who's never done anything like this that specializes in building shopping malls, for example. So the, the, in terms of the fee that they get, um, it's, it's something that you negotiate as part of the GMP which comes before you bid the job, but towards the end of the design process. So at that point, <clears throat> you, you guys, as Brian said, you have the opportunity to walk away. And so they're going to, you know, everything's open book with the CMR process, with a hard bid process or the traditional design bid build. You guys aren't gonna know how much profit, how, many, how much fees a, the low bidder is getting. But with this model, you know everything. You know bonding rates, you know insurance rates, you know their profit and their fees, plus you have bidding on every subcontract. So the drywall contract, the concrete contract, those are all bid openly. So you will, you will know that you're getting multiple bidders and that you're getting the best price. Are you saying that in terms of timing, that yep. you don't get bids for the, the general contractor until after the, the design is well underway? Is that what you're saying? Yes. So typically the contractor is working with us throughout the design process. But we won't know who the general contractor is, will we? Yeah. If you do CMR, you will know. Yeah. But, what, but where's the point where they can get out of it? I don't know. That's the part I don't understand. So if we're locked in with the GC as you're designing, right. when is the moment when we all say, well, we look at the contract and say, does this make sense anymore? Well, that's the GMP. So guaranteed maximum price is going to be offered by Someone. whoever we select, right. you guys select. Um, until that point, you're paying them what we call pre-construction right. services. So a very small amount of money just to pay for their time in estimating and reviewing our design and working. They, I mean, they come to every every meeting at the, at the point that you decide to bring them on. But only when they get to the GMP right. are they actually signing a contract to deliver the project. The, the gross maximum price? That's right. Guaranteed maximum Guaranteed price. price. Uh, what about the criticism that these the extra fees at the beginning means you're paying your general contractor more than you otherwise would using a different method? Well, it's, it's a good question. There's, um, we only build these buildings once, so we don't really ever get to compare, like, would it have been cheaper for us to do it one way or another way, right? Um, the basic feeling about this in the industry is that you probably are paying a slight premium to do CMR, but what are we getting back? Well, first of all, we're transferring the risk that on bid day, you are going to be stuck holding the bag with, a, as, as Brian mentioned, numbers that are just unsustainable for you, right? So the GMP coming before any bids means that if everyone agrees on the GMP and you guys sign that contract, then they open bids. If those bids come in too high, it's on the contractor. It's not on you. So just like anything, when you transfer risk from one party to the other, you'd expect that there's a little bit of a cost associated with that. Some of the other advantages you're going to get are things like um, the CMR um, the, has got a tight relationship with subcontractors and can bring lots of bidders to the table. So they, they have a lot of leverage. These are big contracting companies who work with subcontractors all the time. More contractors coming and bidding means better pricing for you, right? Another thing that they can bring to the table is actually understanding the construction schedule and making sure that you guys have input into that because we're talking about a building that you've got to keep some of these courtrooms open during construction, which could add cost to the project if we're not careful. So. If they're on the team early, they can start helping us understand, identify those challenges, work with you guys, and then you will also have advance notice about these courtrooms need to be closed from this month to this month. 
And so you'll know that in advance. Does the architect's fee change depending upon what method of no. construction we select? It doesn't change a bit. Okay. And should part of the, assuming you're the architect we select, should the, part of the criteria for selecting a GC be their relationship with you or their ability to work with you? That can be a criteria, um, and we'll certainly suggest some good CMRs that we've worked with in the past, but I don't think that's the driving factor. We, we go into these relationships all the time uh, with new contractors that we haven't worked with before. I think the most important selection criteria would be, have they ever done a justice facility? Because there's a lot of unique challenges to this project that other contractors may not be aware of. So I'd rather, even if we've never worked with them before, I'd rather have somebody who's been down this road before for the benefit of, the, of you guys in this project. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Mr. Lashley, I'll spare Ms. Thompson. Well, um, <laughs> you know, it's really bad when you have to go behind Mr. Turner because he takes all your questions away. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate I, I would have waited. I would have waited. I, I appreciate that very much. Uh, you answered the question that I had, the, the major question that I had about this project is uh, it, the, the importance of selecting a contractor that's actually built a courthouse before. I'm not really interested in if he's built uh, a, 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 a sports facility in Raleigh or you know big projects in downtown Charlotte, because courthouses have their unique, they're, it's their own monster, so to speak. So that's what I was concerned about, and I can understand the reasoning behind going the CMR route is slightly more expensive. But would there would there ever be a situation in which you chose a general contractor to build the courthouse in which they went bankrupt? You bond. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, most of them most of them are bonded. Yeah. My understanding is the the bonding and insurance is the same. Yes. Regardless of whether we choose traditional design bid build That's or what I thought. Just so the the risk clear. is the same. Generally, I'd say the, the CMR contractors are a little bit larger firms, mm -hmm. probably a little bit more stable, I would guess. But, but we would still go through the basic bidding process to do this. We would. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we have to. But, but as I mentioned, it's all open book. Right. So you're going to see every detail. You're going to see how much does it cost to park that construction trailer every month yes. out on your site. That's You're not going to get that information out of a uh, normal process. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Let me make one distinction about a comment that was made during the public comments. This is not a project manager. So I think there was discussion about adding a project manager ad, adds cost. I think that's right. Um, it's probably worth it for a complicated project, but that is not what we're talking about here. This is just a different way to bid it. We're not hiring an additional project manager in addition to the general contractor. Ms. Thompson. I really don't have anything to say much. This is the fourth price. We started way up, and we've come down to fourth prices. Um, I think when we're spending this kind of money, we ought to put it on the ballot like we did the educational bond, and that's just my opinion. I don't think it's big enough what you really, really, really need because of the land size. And so uh, construction, any of this, it's just immaterial to me. Don't take it personal. It's just I don't agree with this project. Mr. Carter. Well, Bill, ditto. Um, and I, how does the CMR cover his own risk? Insurance? Go ahead. I, so I'm an architect. I don't, uh, <laughs> I know a lot about the things I know about, but I don't know exactly how those folks make money. Uh, <laughs> I think they do better than architects. <laughs> but uh, but no, I, I don't have the answer to that. From my experience in finance, most of the firms that do this are, are pretty large and have pretty deep pockets. So yeah. they protect themselves in, in that method. They know they've got some fallback if they need it. But, um, and this is not as big a project as it could have been. We've, as, as Thompson just pointed out, we started out at $99 million, and now we're, we're here. And uh, 
Uh, I don't know if we can whittle it any lower or not, but uh, yeah, I, and I, I agree with what uh, what you said, Mr. Baker. It's it's not a separate person we're hiring to manage it. It's the project, the construction company. So they're on the hook. And we have had instances at Reynolds Coliseum, which we did a renovation for. Hey, pardon? At Reynolds Coliseum, we did a renovation there, and the CMR basically guessed wrong, and they were they had to eat it. It was over a million and a half dollars, and I to this day don't know where they came up with that, <laughs> uh, but they were a big company, and maybe they were able to absorb it. Well, when we're at, uh, if we attend the uh, North Carolina Association of County Commissioners conferences, quite often we we get an opportunity to meet with a number of the people that do the courthouse construction, do jail construction. They're all at these events talking about what their experience levels are to uh, get in front of commissioners when they're there. And uh, uh, there are some very experienced companies that do this kind of work. So. So I will ask for a vote on the resolution to authorize construction manager risk when, when you're ready. Yeah, Sounds like you I got get, a question. <laughs> I get an opportunity to speak or ask questions. Sorry about that. Uh, with the jail from the courts building, we had a contractor who bid her lawsuits. With the J.B. Allen building, we had low bidder uh, conflicts between engineers and uh, contractors and, and litigation. This at-risk management philosophy or policy eliminates that, does it not? Yeah. Explain. Yeah, you're right, and that's uh, having everybody on the team at the beginning and deciding whose risk lies where helps you avoid litigation and maybe it's a couple percentage points more expensive on the front end, but you're right, all of our big projects, a lot of big projects have years of litigation following to figure out who messed up, what's wrong. Um, and this helps to avoid that, that added expense and added trouble. We basically have one entity to go back and complain, and they're it. Yeah, we like to, we like to say that they're in the boat with us, right? So they can't come back and say, well, that wasn't our decision. We didn't know about that. Well, that, that's why starting early like you guys are doing, I mean, when we start design, they're going to be right here on my hip the whole time. And they're not going to be able to claim that they didn't know. Thank you. Board, any other questions? Ron, now continue. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's it for me. I do need a, 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 need a formal uh, resolution to authorize using this bidding method. Motion to approve. Which one? Construction manager at risk. Thank you. I'll second that. Any other discussion or questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay, four to one, yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Chairman, I wonder if we might just have a brief Q&A about timeline. Do we, do we have a rough yeah. timeline for when things begin and the stages that are involved? So we've talked about this a little bit. We think that it's about a 12-month design process. So that means in 12 months we'd be ready to put the project out for bids. And then the bidding process usually takes two months to get it all wrapped up in contract signed, assuming that we get coverage on all the bid packages. And uh, then the actual construction period, this is where we're going to lean heavily on the CMR to help us identify that duration and come up with ways to keep it as reasonable as possible. But just, again, shooting from the hip at this early, early stage, understanding that you've got possible phasing to do in order to keep those courtrooms operational, we're thinking probably an 18-month period of construction. Um, but again, I, I think 
the very first order of business when a CMR gets put onto the team is to develop that schedule much more detailed and uh, get a true picture. At when can we expect this to the bid process to go for the architect, solidify that process, and then the and then the GC? So we'll do the the. Uh, those processes at the same time, and we actually need to go back and look at the contracts we've already signed with CRA. We may not need to rebid this because we chose them to do a courthouse design process with us years ago. We just got to make sure those are still good, but we can start those processes pretty quickly. Can I ask you a question? While you're doing all this construction, will the parking lot have the yellow tape? You know what I'm talking about, that you're not supposed to be because all the heavy construction equipment and materials and supplies will the parking lot be closed unless it's down near the magistrate so we'll definitely have to close some portions of the parking lot we'll be building the building on some yeah. portions of the parking lot yeah. there's no way to close it all right we, we that's going to be the hardest part of this yeah. is figuring out where people are going to park and where they're going to have court gotcha. while we're building other okay. things so it is a phasing process and yeah we haven't gotten there yet okay. we're working on that yeah we're working on that. i got a guy yeah <laughs> Uh, I got one question as well. Just because you, uh, thanks for laying out the timeline. That's very helpful. Uh, I'm looking at uh, 14 and 18. That's 32 months before we'd have construction to be finished. So that, I mean, I'm just throwing it out there. So the reason I'm asking is if you take 12 months to design it, which I don't understand. I'm not an architect. That's that's why. Uh, but are you positive that we're going to be able to get the same courthouse for $37 million than we think we're going to get. Because, you know, watching the school system go through some of the things that they went through, now I know inflation at the time was, was screaming. Street. Yeah, it was screaming. And I know it's come down a little bit, but are you confident that you'll be able to get the same courthouse, $37 million that you're hoping for? So I'm confident. I'm confident in that we haven't yet promised you a particular courthouse. <laughs> so yes, so that I'm confident of it as well. Yes. I'm confident we haven't done that. So yes, we can meet our targets. No, I. There's a lot of unknowns sure. here, and that's one of the advantages of this process. Let's go through it. Let's see what we're going to get. I mean, I think we've got a, an amount of money we've decided on, and we know what we want to get out of that. And hopefully that's where we'll end up. Um, if not, we need to know that up front. We need sure. to talk through it and make those choices. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. No worries. Thank you. One thing I might add, we have roughly $15 million set aside. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's going to help and will hopefully prevent a tax increase we don't know. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We had ten million. Has that changed? So we had uh, from our last meeting, we right. set aside and ten I've, from all. That's of been there for a while. And yeah. five million from uh, cutting out orchards in another building. That's fifteen. Okay. Mr. Coleman, we want to thank you for being here. Great to be here. Still, Thanks, sir. Still here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're going to move to 7C, uh, free valuation contract, county manager. I'm popped up over here. here. Good That's evening, like commissioners. You see on TV. You know, yeah. Easy as and really there. I've moved quickly. All right, we wanted to talk to you tonight about uh, revaluation. I know it feels like we've spoken a lot about revaluation. Your last one occurred in 2023. That's why it's still uh, being discussed quite heavily. We have a few more appeals to get through before that process is concluded. But if we want to go with a four-year revaluation cycle, which is what the board has indicated previously, it is time to uh, start that process now. Data collection would begin fairly immediately so that we could collect necessary data and get this process moving forward so that it can be in place by the by 2027. So our 2023 uh, reval was a six-year reval. It was a hybrid approach, which means that we used both in-house staff and contracted out with a contractor. 
Um, I'm going to go through a few slides here, um, but not go uh, thoroughly over the whole thing. Just a reminder of what a reappraisal is. All real property is appraised at the current market value as of a particular date. Uh, real property then includes land and any improvements on it. That goes for residential, commercial, agricultural, and industrial. State law, as you know, requires reappraisals to be done at least once every eight years. And counties that are experiencing growth, like Alamance County, typically do conduct reappraisals more frequently. This helps level out lots of uh, spikes in value. Uh, this helps keep you current with the market um, for those counties. There are some standards um, that the North Carolina Department of Revenue puts out for a reappraisal process, and I've been learning quite a bit about this here recently. So there are different types of reappraisals, and you decide on the type of reappraisal based on the accuracy of the data that you have. The first type is called a full measure and list. I like to think of this as boots on the ground, measuring tape in hand. They would visit every single parcel and actually do some, some measurements for you. There's a walk around, which still would mean boots on the ground, maybe not a measuring tape is how I think about that one. They're just checking for data accuracy. There's a street review only. So this would be driving in a car. Is there a house there? Yes, it looks like it's, the, the data looks like what we have on the parcel card. There's a desktop reappraisal, which you can look at data, you can look at maps, pictometry, um, but you're not actually going out on site. And then finally, the uh, Department of Revenue says that you can do some combination of the above types. Again, it's based on the quality of the data that you have. The Department of Revenue further states that a physical review of the parcels should include an on-site verification of property characteristics. This should be done every four to six years. So at some point in four to six years, somebody should be going out on site to verify that the data is accurate. They also say if you have a good timely completion of these physical inspections and you have an effective system uh, where you're obtaining data through, through your building permits, then you can use these digital imaging tools to help supplement your reinspections in the field. And we're unsure of when Alamance County's last full measure and list reappraisal was. The tax office staff guesses that it was approximately 1993, which puts us over 30 years since we've done a full measure and list. So I have to recommend that it is well over time. We're, we're, we're overdue for, for this type of reappraisal. So this would be different. Um, what we're offering with this contract would be a different type of reappraisal than what you have experienced in the last 30 years. We're also recommending uh, outsourcing of reevaluation. Uh, we are seeing kind of a wave across the state where counties now are moving much more towards outsourcing than doing it in-house. The costs, the capabilities of staff, and the capacity of staff in place have really made an internal or an in-house process just highly unobtainable for us. That would be true even for the hybrid approach, which we did last time, would not be feasible for us at this point in time. The contractor is bringing to the table a, a full staff, a team who's been vetted and trained, and they are focusing solely on the revaluation process. The tax office staff would continue to do their day-to-day -day operations. So the reval team that comes in, they are doing nothing but revaluation at that point. And we're at a point where we're saying that improving our data and the quality of our data is really imperative. We have discovered that we really want to improve the data that we have on hand, and we think that outsourcing would, you, would allow us to do that. This is the, the reappraisal team that you could expect um, from Vincent Valuations here. We, um, I list all of these folks, but um, it's much more extensive than what we have in-house with our tax office. We also know that this, 
the team here would cost about one and a half million dollars annually in salaries if you were to employ all of these folks. By bringing in the reappraisal team, you're not permanently putting these folks uh, on your as as full time county employees, right? They are here just to do the reappraisal, and then you're you're not employing them beyond that. And we also would not have overtime, holidays, uh, medical, right? Or any of the other expenses. benefits, right? and vehicles and computers and training. And it's very difficult to get skilled, trained appraisers at this point. Um, the market has just made it hard to find them. So we would struggle to recruit and retain the right talent to do a process that we want here in Alamance County. Did you have a question? Now, does this process start over again when it finishes? It would depend on whether or not we were committed to another four-year cycle, which we most likely would be. But once you have high-quality data, you could step down the type of appraisal that you would need for the next year, potentially. So then the, then the goal would be to make sure that on new additions we had high-quality data. That's right. Yep. That's exactly right. Oops, I went the wrong way. Um, here's some cost estimates of what we had seen previously, uh, going back to 2001, which was the last time you had an outsourced um, reval. And there's an infl inflationary adjustment showing here that's about 3% um, based on the CPI. <clears throat> the outsource estimate that we have for this upcoming one is uh, $2,574,000 is what we're being given as an estimate. And this number is based on the number of parcels that Alamance County has. So the recommendations that we have are to go with the full measure and list, <clears throat> the type of um, reappraisal that we think we need. We have approximately 76,000 parcels currently. That's an estimate, it may change. Um, but that's what the number is, the cost estimates are based on. So a full measure and list means that all 76,000 parcels would be visited and measured and verified for accuracy of data. The contract that we have here um, from Vincent Valuations or that we will be working on with them would be for what I'm calling a turnkey reval process. This is from data collection all the way through the appeals process. So even with the North Carolina Property Tax Commission, they would handle the full scope of the reappraisal. Counties are required to set aside funds for reval. So we have a fund for called revaluation. We have set aside a million dollars in your current fiscal year. We would recommend this would be a reoccurring budgeted amount for the next two years, which would more than cover the cost of your reval contract. And we're also recommending then that you authorize staff to proceed with a contract. So we would work on that um, between our legal team and Vincent Valuations and then bring that back for approval at a future meeting if this is the direction that the board would like to go. I do have Ryan Vincent here with us tonight. He leads the Vincent Valuations team and has been working with Alamance County for quite some time. If there are questions um, that he can answer about the technical aspect of reval, uh, he's here to help help me with that. What questions can I answer for you, commissioners? It looks like to me we're going to save a lot of money by retaining Vincent over salaries and all the fringe benefits of medical and everything else. And we'll not have, uh, go back to your other slide. This one. Number, how many employees would oh, that? The team. 15? No, so there's 15 data collectors. We actually don't really have data collectors uh, on staff. We don't have data entry folks on staff either. So we have some appraisers and Looks like you're, <laughs> if you added up, 23 employees. 26. 26. Did you want to speak to the staffing team, Ryan? Yeah. I'm not sure. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so it would be. Um, it, it would fluctuate based on the stage of the project. Um, but initially, you would need all of the data collectors, you'd need the project manager, and you would need all the data entry. And once you get through with the data collection process, the data collectors are no longer needed. Then the appraiser team comes in and does the review work and the valuation work. Um, so it's not to say that there's going to be 25 people here for the next two and a half years. There might be 20 people here, and then that will phase based on the timeline of the project and the but status of each project. They're your employees. Yes, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're, I'm responsible for them. Um, one thing that I did want to add, I think it came up in a previous meeting, um, the Department of Revenue, I think it's either DOR or school government, they keep a list of the counties that contract out and do hybrid uh, and do completely in-house. So right now there's, uh, of the counties who responded, there was 45 counties who did a hybrid approach to reappraisal. There is 27 counties that fully contract out and there's 28 that do uh, complete in-house work. Um, so those are the, the numbers across the state of the, the folks who responded to that and what those counties do. So what would we have to have in order to do a full in-house revalue staff-wise? Is that for me? Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically you would have to have all of these folks and you, you'd either have to bring them in as full-time county employees or go find them as temporary contract data collectors, use them for the time that you need them, have somebody here to manage them and train them, and then um, they would no longer work with the county after they were um, done with that phase of the project. So that would be 28. 28 people in addition to the, what, 30 that we currently have on staff, is that correct? So we'd almost double our, have to double our staff in order to get it done. Not all and, the and time, obviously. But it, you would right. need them going on because, like we said, at the end of four years, it starts all over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... and um, or some combination of it does. Yeah, and finding staff is very difficult right now. Um, I keep up on the tax administrator positions in North Carolina right now. Um, there's seven, possibly eight, open tax administrator positions in North Carolina. Um, I can't recall, I've been doing this 18 years, I can't recall ever a time that there's ever been that many open tax administrator positions. Um, so it is really a struggle for counties to find good qualified staff from the top all the way down. And uh, I, I know it's not just the, the tax appraisal industry, I know it's industries across the board. Um, so that, that's just a perspective that I see from doing this across the entire state of, of North Carolina. But if we retain your, your firm, your folks are already trained, mm -hmm. already qualified. We don't have to advertise. We don't have to find people off the street yeah. that are likely not qualified who are out, sent, sent out to, I was here in 19, what was the year, 92? 93. 93. 93. Is when they, they I was here, the uh, and it was funny. You started getting calls into the newspapers, the radio shows, uh, the sheriff's department and police departments about some guys in my backyard walking around. I would guess that you will advertise and forecast there will be people coming out yep. They will have identification, yep. unlike the 1993 yeah. occurrence, yep. uh, and everybody will be informed and prepared. Yeah, and and to that effect, though, no matter what you do, you're not going to reach everybody. Um, just just so we're totally clear, we'll work with the county in every way we can. Our folks wear green construction vests that would say Alamance County Tax Office, county issued IDs. They have magnets on the sides of their cars. We do everything we can. But at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to reach everybody to get the word out. Well, it won't be like 1993. I was not. I was not in, doing this in 1993. When, when someone walked in my backyard with just a T-shirt on, and no, yeah, and looking around with no notification. Yeah, yeah no, yeah, no, that, that, that that's one. completely unacceptable. Exactly. 
Board, any other questions? I have a few. Um, so you have all these trained people in your team. How come we don't on our team? You see the price tag? I, I, I can't help that. I'm just asking about that because um, I want to know the difference. And I mean, is this specifically just for this kind of task? Whereas ours collect money, and what else? Yeah. So your office does your office does a multitude of things outside of reappraisal. Okay. Your office um, collects money, like you said. Your office uh, assesses personal property tax, uh, both both for personal property and for business personal property. Um, I don't know if mapping, I think GIS, yeah. is GIS under tax? Or they is mapping under tax? They were GIS, okay. <clears throat> but they're separating parcels out um, for new subdivisions. We, we do that in-house in the tax office. And then, yeah, and then the, the appraisal work, um, the annual appraisal work. So in meeting um, with Heidi this morning, we were discussing the amount of permits that are currently out there. To, to put it into perspective, there was 1,190 permits that came in to the tax office just for the month of August. And so that is the responsibility of the tax office to go out, which was discussed earlier, visit those permits, check for new improvements, additions, and so on. And so um, there's, there's, with the growth comes also a lot of what we call annual work that has to be done and reappraisal is in addition to the annual work. Okay. When you mention like one million you put in the budget and then you would continue to this as part, what what do we have to lose as far as our departments across the county to cover this? Is there anything that's taken away from the county? Or was that okay. No. All right. Um, and like the, the commercial aspect. Um, I have questions about that. I have the whole time. Is that something that you will do to make sure that all these commercial things, because I really just don't think we've gotten the revenue that we really have. We, I don't know. I, I'm this, I just don't think we have been able to get the revenue off of that that we could have, and it feels like it's fell back on us citizens. That's what, what I hear all the time. Can yeah. you just talk about that? Yeah, so with, with a turnkey reappraisal, we're responsible for commercial. Um, so we have a few folks within our organization that, that are specialists, you might say, in commercial. So they go from county to county to do commercial properties. Um, there is variations in commercial value when you go county to county, but there also is certain types of commercial property that are typically valued the same based on where they're at because of the business model of the organization. Um, not going to name any specific types of property, but you can think about it as you drive across the state. You see the same, the same names uh, in certain places. And typically, based on their business model, um, those are valued generally within line with each other throughout the state. Um, so we have folks that specialize just in, in doing commercial property. So yes, commercial is part of a, a turnkey reappraisal. But that wouldn't be basically the same year, the same amount, just roll it over. It just depends on what's moved in beside it and the, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it depends, on, it depends on the market. And again, all of this is based on a willing buyer and a willing seller. And that's the most difficult piece of all of this is it's a practice and it is an estimate. It's an estimate based on the data we have and the facts we have at the time. So if we look at some of the things that have transpired since the last reappraisal, some facts have come to light that we didn't know about at the time of the reappraisal. Um, it's also, again, based on sales. So we try to look at all of the sales locally that we can, and sometimes with certain special types of property, we have to go outside the county. Um, I'm sure you can all think of a piece of property that's unique within this county, and we might not have any sales that to use to value that type of property. So we're going to have to go to surrounding counties or other parts of the state for those special use types of properties. And one last question. You guys worked with us on this 2023, right? Yeah, we, we did some of the residential review, and we helped with, uh, with the appeal process. So also. you didn't do any of the commercial? We did a little bit of the commercial. Okay, so this yeah. time it's either all you or nothing. You're not. We're uh, not going to have that team thing. That's well. 
I'm just asking. <laughs> I mean, because that's what we, I'm hearing. Because if you're yeah. doing this, I don't. What are they yeah. doing? I mean, yeah. you seem to have the whole thing covered. Yeah. So the. If, you, if the county were to choose to go forward with this, all of the reappraisal activities would be the responsibility of us. All that responsibility would be placed on us to do the field work, the valuation, the appeals process, so on and so forth. It's, okay. So it's all you or nothing. So it's, it's just striking, and I know this is what this is, that we're, we taxpayers are paying you to do our taxes. I mean, you know, and like last time, it's just a lot of questions that went on, and I'm just asking them, because I got phone calls just like all these gentlemen did, and that's just why I'm asking. I just want this to be done correctly so that every person in this county pays their equal amount to each other, whatever that looks like. It needs to be really balanced. Not one particular group pays and carries the burden as compared to others, because yeah. um, that's I've heard that, and I'm sure they have too. Mr. Lashley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you for uh, being here, Mr. Vincent. Um, appreciate what you said. Um, you know, I just did a little math. 76,000 parcels in Alamance County, 52 weeks in the year, five days a week. You're going to have to probably inspect roughly 300 pieces of property a day. Mm -hmm. And I think you're probably going to need the help of the Alamance County Tax Department assessors in that process. Um, also looking at, this is a question maybe Heidi can answer real quick. This is an annual, $2.6 million annually? It's, no, it's, it's total. Yeah, thank okay. you for the opportunity to clarify that. Sure. That's the total contract for the entire time from now until it's Perfect. over that's right what I thought. Um, okay and that's what makes their job so important for us getting this done and we're invoiced as progress is made along the way so well, it's not like you're paying the full price right away right we can set aside money as we go and Ryan and I were talking this morning even the first year he doesn't think we'll have a million dollars worth of payout to them so just based on the pace. You, Heidi, is will our tax department be helping him with these assessments of these individual parcels? Do you want to answer that? Or you want um, if in a, in a turnkey reappraisal, typically we work with them um, if they want some training on what we're doing, on our processes and procedures and how we do things, we'd be happy to do that. Um, but if we are contracted to do a turnkey reappraisal, then that's on us to get it done. Sure. If the tax office wants to go out in the field with us and the appraisers want to see what we're doing or how we're doing or why we're doing at any part of the process, we'd be happy to do that. Um, mm -hmm. We've had counties where we've taken commissioners out in the field with us um, just as part of it, just so y'all can see what we do and what it's like to, to be in the field. Um, but if the county were to choose to go this way, that responsibility would be solely on us. Okay, excellent. Thank you. A um, couple of more, more, more questions. So, uh, Heidi, we are going to do, I mean, I was, I'm was. i glad you made that statement tonight about 1993 because I went back and looked at the last time we'd had, uh, how did you put it, a full measure? Measure and list, yes. Uh, yeah, 1993 is the last time I could, I, I could uh, find out anything. The only reason I can even find that out is talking to a couple of farmers who had their property reevaluated in 1993. Uh, and they've been in business since. Um, so that's important that we do that for all 76 thousand parcels. parcels. 76,000, excuse me. Yeah. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's imperative that we do every single one this time since it's been 30 years. It's imperative that we do that. So we can actually kill two birds with one stone with what you were talking about earlier. It's not having very good data. Now, if you take $2.6 million that we're going to pay Vincent to do this reevaluation for us and divide it into $26 billion, that might be something for you to, but to uh, figure out. If my, if my math is right... It's less than one-tenth of one percent to get the value of what we have in Alamance County. That's cheap. As a manager, that's super cheap. 
to figure out what you have because what I know is going to happen, and I will bet anybody any amount of money that this is going to happen. Once we go and look at all these parcels of land, we are going to retrieve a hell of a lot more than $2.6 million. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> That is what we expect. I would expect you get a number that's probably 10, 20 fold, if not more. I mean, you were going to find money that we didn't even know we had because I know so many places around this county that has buildings in it and on it <laughs> that we don't even know existed. So uh, with that being said, I, I, I think it's a, it's a good idea. Uh, I just I know that Vincent's going to, um, I mean, we were t you're talking about data entry, folks. Should we get some data entry folks to take your data and put it in our system? I mean, because it seems like if we have if we have really good data, we may next time we come to this bridge and we have to cross it, we won't have to go the full the full measurement. We can probably do the walk around. Yeah, and that's and that's what um, the last few counties. Um, there's one that we're working on that's very similar to size in Alamance and. We did a full measuring list with them, and now we're doing a walk around four years later with them. Um, it's a little bit cheaper. Um, they're a very rapidly growing county, um, similar to you guys. And to your point about um, finding stuff, uh, we we always always do. Um, we always do. I think we may find some uh, revenues that we didn't know existed that may help us pay mm -hmm. for this courthouse and make us pay for other things that we've spent money for. Maybe we won't have to raise taxes. Maybe we drop taxes. <laughs> talk to your three commissioners who raised your taxes, sir. Don't talk to me. I'm sorry. Sure. Just for a second, can I just tag on the bill? Just one some question. Why didn't we know? Why didn't we he know? He said we may find all these places that we didn't even know we had. Why didn't we know? Because we didn't have a walk around. We didn't have a full measure. Because, you know, people don't actually follow the rules and they put up buildings without going through the proper inspections department. Make additions to houses. Yes, exactly. We found that during the, uh, during the, um, what was it called, the uh, appeals process. People come in and appeal <laughs> when they presented what they actually That's had. Fine. Just a question because it just triggered something. I just wonder. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Benson, how often do you recommend a full measure evaluation? It depends on the last time it was done. Usually at least every 8 to 12 years okay. is what um, years. what we would recommend. So if we did this this year, then probably wouldn't have to do that again next year. Did, no, you, not for the next year. Do... I wouldn't recommend it for the next reappraisal cycle, no. What's what's the, uh, it's not full measure, what's it called? It's a walk around. Walk around. Yeah. If you're doing a walk around, do the do these numbers of people change or do you keep the same number of people and it's a different? Amount? The number of people of data collectors would go down slightly because they're going to do more per day because they're not doing as in depth of measurements when they go there. In fact, they're only measuring in a walk around if something looks wrong. And that's where. The difference between a walk around and a measure and list come in because you and I might look at that wall, for example, and say that that wall is, I say it's 20 feet, the property record card, the tax data says it's 25. Um, you might check it off. I might say, okay, well, we got to go ahead and measure it. So it leaves a lot of judgment up to the folks in the field, and there's no guarantee um, from the contractor side that we check that wall, for example. And you mentioned the number of counties that do in-house revaluations. Mm -hmm. um, does does that number depend upon what kind of reevaluation the county is doing? For it, instance, you might have more counties doing in-house if it's a walker. Uh, most of the counties that are doing in-house are not doing measuring lists or walk arounds, in my experience. Okay, so and, even a walk around is probably outsourced. Yeah, and and year over year, that number of fully in-house counties is dwindling, again due to staffing. Um, and resources and things like that. Um, if we use you guys, to, your commercial appraisers, um, you would use the same commercial appraisers for elements that you've used for other counties in the past? Yeah. Those yeah. folks for a particular retailer would have knowledge of what that particular retailer yeah. valuation and, is yep. in a different county and could yep. bring that knowledge yep. to this process as well? Yes, sir. And, and where you really learn a lot is through the appeals process, right. as mm -hmm. we know. Um, and so we try to, to, to keep those folks um, 
on the commercial. So doing the commercial valuation through the commercial appeals process, the next county commercial evaluation, commercial appeals process. If we use Vincent for, for this uh, for this piece, uh, or for all of it for this cycle, do we have, will, will our FTEs and tax be fully employed? I mean, will they, will they have a full-time job that's worth of work to do? Yeah, so the day-to-day -day operations of the tax office would stay consistent. We're there's still work for those folks to do. We are what doing that. We are playing catch up, okay. trying to keep up with all of the new permitting that is coming online. Um, there were two positions cut in this budget of, on the appraisal side, two retiree retirements that we did not fill. So we are really in a position right now where we're just playing catch up. They are have very full plates and are trying to get everything caught up by the January 1 date that they're required to have that done. So that will continue. And so long as our growth stays somewhat consistent, we would you know, continue to need what we have in place. Okay. I would say I was skeptical of this when, when we first talked about this about yes. two months ago. Um, I think you convinced me that at least for this round, we ought to do this. I think once we get a new tax administrator in, then that person can evaluate sort of where the tax department is in terms of its strengths and weaknesses and whether we hire to the to fill folks who can do this next time or, or not. Mm -hmm. That's what I think we should do. Okay. Mr. Carr. Now, this is just a curiosity. Uh, you're looking at properties over a three-year period. So your data collection is going to take a full three years, I presume, right? The data collection will probably, if we started, let's say we started the middle of October, we would shoot to be done with the data collection um, winter or springtime of 2026. So roughly nine months to a year before the reappraisals due, then that would give us that nine months to a year to go through again and review the properties and do our final valuation and analysis the on them. Okay. I was I mean, trying to figure out how we were going to get to all to one value at one time, yep, one yep. point in time. So. Do, do we own the data, or do you own the data? No, you own the data. Really? We're key, we're keying it into your system. Okay. All the values come out of your CAMA computer assisted mass appraisal. And you system. won't need the help of our our folks in the tax department to help you with these properties. <laughs> no, we we do this all over the country, yeah. or all excuse me, all over the state. Well, um, I guess I guess what I'm actually looking for is how long. I mean, I know it's I know each property varies because you can go through mm -hmm. a subdivision and probably do ten houses in an hour. Yep. Well, or you go to a like Henry Vines's farm. It's just you know, I, I know these things <laughs> yep. are different in time. So you're confident that you can do it in yep. nine months to a year. Yeah. I'm impressed. I yeah. definitely want to come check it out. Yeah. Yeah, no, anytime you guys want to go for a field trip, let us know. Yeah, let's, set that, let, let's definitely set yeah. that up. I'd like to yeah. see that, too. Well, yeah, Mr. Lashley estimated 300 per day. Mm -hmm. 15 collectors, that's 20 per day. Seems like a Some lot. Some are going to be quick. Yep. And Some that's and, and like you said, if you get in a subdivision, you might get 30 or 40 or 50 done in a day, but you might get to some larger commercial or industrial complexes where you're measuring one or two or three a day. Yeah. Um, so we try to shoot for that 20 to 25 average, mm -hmm. and that's where these numbers come from. Perfect. The math is easy. 300 yeah. divided by 15 is 20. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. That Thank makes you. it much easier. Thank you. Uh, okay. I'm going to make a motion at this point that we, one, uh, do the full on-site appraisal, and two, retain Vincent Valua Valuations LLC to do the work. Second, I'll second that. We have two seconds. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Clark, can you yeah. give that to Mr. Ashley or Mr. Carter? I'll give it to Mr. Carter. <laughs> I, I got one more on tonight as it is. Any further discussion with the board? I just want to thank you for doing this, and I just, it's a lot for me to vote for this, with spending this kind of money for taxes, but I know they'll be done right, because I don't have the confidence in the last go round. So thank you. Additionally, I think it's going to save us money. Well, yeah, we've already set aside in this year's budget a million dollars of your cost. Um, if we set aside 700000 
the next three years, we've over overpriced it. Yeah, I'm curious to see how much um, tax base increases just by going out yeah. because if it's if it's 26 billion now, mm -hmm. what could it be? I'm curious. I'll be watching. Any other comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's by vote. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And we appreciate your coming tonight. Yeah, He's not listening, but <laughs> very informative. <laughs> okay. Oh. Um, County Attorney. Nothing for me, Board. Thank you. Best speech all night. Thank you. <laughs> County Manager. Nothing for me, sir. Second best speech all night. <laughs> oh. County Commissioners, Ms. Thompson. Well, I, I don't really have anything to talk about the county, but I did want to make a, a statement as far as what, um, what our parents and kids experienced last week with the threat. Um, of something happening at a school and um, following right after the young man that went and decided to go in his Georgia school and shoot two teachers and two students you know we, we just cannot think it's just another school because we have so many because um, I've always said it's not if it's when you, you just never know but I just wanted to say something as like coming from a mom who's got children and I we had some situations when my kids were in school and it is absolutely unsettling and when you take distraction and stress and anxiety and fear and doubt um, these are all emotions that can just wipe us all out and I've seen it I've, I felt it I've seen it on Facebook I mean people were just just heavy and so much violence in the world we just we call it our children are constantly bombarded with the negatives that just affect their lives tremendously we continue to see school shootings on the media we learned that the background of a young person shooter whatever you want to call them is once again as always the seeds of good are planted and the seeds of destruction are always planted in that home we want our children to be amazing but they will be us because they have watched us every day we are their example. When you add to social media and extreme vulgar music, gangs, idolatry, we see that in politics. People think that politicians going to just on that water. And it's of what that they want to be and you end up with a 14 year old who walks in and kills two teachers and two children. I can't imagine getting that call as a mom. You see a young man walk into a church in a prayer group and he listens to them study the Word of God, and in and out about an hour, and then he turns around and kills everyone. You watch a young man get on a roof in broad daylight and shoot at a presidential candidate. I, I just could go on and on, unfortunately, and that's just really overwhelming. Um, I see our priorities as leaders, and sometimes they can just seem like they're just always about money because they have to be. We have a lot of things we have to pay. But I know one thing you can't pay is evil. You can't pay it out. So last week with the online shooter threat, everyone was just gripped with fear, distraction, stress, anxiety, and doubt. Thank the Lord we weren't the latest massacre on the news. But we still had this chaos, and because it wreaked havoc without one shot even fired. Thank goodness, that is power. And the smallest and most powerful part of a human is their tongue. It can encourage, it can support, it can destroy, and it can berate. We know this because it's scripture in James 1, 8, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse him. We are watching just a tsunami of death and destruction just grip our country. Uh, we can get so caught up in this, it's like a wave, and if we stay glued to our phones, our laptops, our TVs, there was just another situation that was just, this is just where we are. There's the other situation I want to remind us all, because it's, it's based on the same kind of principle, is, you know, when Christ was on this world, he healed the lame, he cured the sick, he saved the lives, he raised the dead, he loved, he encouraged, he taught, and he came here to save us. One day they're laying palm leaves down and they're laying their coats down. 
so that he can ride in on it because they want him as their king. Not the kind of king that they wanted, but the kind of king just to win wars. And that, then five minutes later, it seemed like, three days later, they were screaming, crucify him. They even traded him out for a well-known murderer, Barabbas. And the days in between had to be just like what we're watching on the media. People distracted, people stressed, people full of anxiety, people fearful, people doubtful. I just pray that we stop this madness before we totally ruin our children. Because of the stress they have, we have so many things to be thankful for in America. And so many times we can't see that because we're so worried about what we don't have. So I just want us to get our eyes back on where they should be and realize that if your kid is struggling, you need to talk to them about it. And if you're doing things in your home that is not good for your kids, you need to talk about it because if you wonder why children go off and bring guns to school and tell their teacher F you and all kind of stuff that they say and they just do, we're doing it to them. This world is like an oil slick and there's a bird on the shore and the next thing you know he's covered in oil. It ain't the oil that's going to take the life out of him. So I just um, want us to take a time and I want to thank Jackie Fortner because I called him about something and um, he called me right back the next morning and, and gave me my answer and it's a real heartbreaking answer because our children are suffering at the hands of the decisions we adults keep making. And um, the things that are said, it's like the giant game of tag. The media is like a pinball machine. They bounce from things to things. And they're all going to need therapy after this election. I hope they go somewhere and stay for a good year because um, they have lost their minds over what they think they can say and it doesn't impress upon young people. So if kids are not doing good in school and they're acting up in school and their teachers are wore out, it's happening to them. And we need to really get our act together as leaders to make sure that we keep them as safe as possible because we are not going to always lead. We are trying to train them and equip them to be the next great leaders of this world, this state, this county, this right here, because I think they're worth everything we can put into them. So that's just a mom comment because um, it's a tough time to be a kid. And if I thought somebody was going to shoot up my kid's school, there's nothing you can keep a mother from her children. Nothing. So, thank you. Mr. Washer. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to um, thank Henry Chandler for what you brought in tonight because it was very informative. <laughs> we didn't really have any pictures about things like that. And I think a lot of people in this county agree with you about the lot size. And it, like I said in the last meeting, it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to put as many houses in a piece of land, that's what you're going to do. If your goal is to not, then you won't. <clears throat> but I wanted just to make sure that the uh, other speakers uh, heard what they needed to tonight uh, because I'm glad about this meeting. Well, one reason is because we uh, actually talked about some things that people in the audience came up and spoke about tonight. So I hope that they got the answers or at least got a little more information than they, they had before they came. But that's it. Sure. I actually had a couple questions for staff, one about land use and one about the ADSS facilities. Uh, uh, sure, we, we, the board discussed at the last meeting that we wanted the planning department to come back and provide some more information about the lot size recommendations. Right. They were going to do a little bit of a more comprehensive look. Do you just have a sense of when we might get some information back? And I'm guessing that goes through the planning board and then up to us. That's right. It would go through the planning board and their meeting again in October. Yeah, I think best case scenario, we'd be able to bring it to the planning board in October, yep. maybe November. I think it would probably take them till November, the planning board, to make a recommendation at a minimum. Okay. So I don't anticipate this coming back to this board before that you know before december january um we don't have to do it in that order you know we could we can bring it to both boards simultaneously if if we want to that actually may not be a bad idea yeah but look forward to getting that when when that's ready okay. um abss facilities i had asked at the last meeting about how much money we had funded uh back into the school capital reserves and I guess about this time every year, we, we talk about refunding that based upon the sales tax that the school system gets based upon statute. And so I think that fund is now at $1.7 million. Is that That's right? correct. 
Okay. I, I would certainly be interested in the school system providing uh, some type of plan for how we might use that based on what I understand that the priorities are, which is the roof and HVAC list that we currently have. I'd certainly be in the, interested in using some of that to fund those high priority projects and to start moving those forward. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Carter. Uh, well, I agree with what uh, Commissioner Turner just said about high priority projects for the school. Let's get that moving forward as quickly as we can. And uh, I was really impressed by the young people here tonight. I mean, um, I've had the opportunity now to attend, I think, five of the graduation ceremonies. and. Uh, four or five of them, and uh, some fine young people that have turned, basically turned their lives around in most cases, uh, that are opportunities to become leaders in our community. They, they, might not, they may have led before in a different direction. Now they got an opportunity to try and lead and lead their friends, their associates in the right direction. So that's, a, that's a wonderful opportunity for our county to provide that, and I think we, it's the, the, the uh, uh, ROI, return on investment on that, is huge. We don't want to see it stop. So I appreciate us giving them an opportunity to come before us tonight. That, that crowd was a lot bigger if you, if you were actually at the, the graduation. That's a huge group. I think they said about half the uh, kids were here tonight. Yeah. And the kids have so many conflicts and, and other obligations. Uh, I, like Mr. Carter, have attended many of those police academy uh, graduations. And my wife, who taught for 42 years, saw a tremendous turnaround for many children who walked into the school year troubled, uh, having problems, uh, discipline issues, and so forth. And after that police academy the next year, totally different children and became leaders of their class and in the school and turned their entire lives around. Uh, Ms. Thompson, I have one request. Never tell a football player that it looks cute in a helmet. <laughs> I think Travis Kelsey's right cute. I think they all are, so hey. <laughs> he was big. When I went to dinner, I thought, Wow, he's a big young man. <laughs> Gentle giant. <laughs> oh, I thought that was funny. Leonard Harrison, who usually sits on the first or second row, is not here tonight. He's gone down east with his hur hurricane group uh, providing help and assistance for those who are enduring floods in the east part of the state. So we thank Mr. Harrison for what he always does in those scenarios and specifically for this particular storm. Uh, additionally, I did talk to Donald Roos with VIA uh, and I think things are uh, moving forward. Uh, I think he talked to the county manager or uh, Mr. Baker, one or the other, uh, recently and talked about things that are upcoming and licensing and things of that sort. And I've asked him if he would give us an update, possibly at our next meeting. And so we'll see more uh, advancement with VIA. Um, and the gentleman in this crowd right here is a large part to do with the behavioral uh, medical facility. Um, and we appreciate everything that you've done. Uh, that without the help of the construction company and the builder in that situation, it would never have been done on time and or at the cost that eventually was incurred. Um, basically, I want to thank everybody that's, that was here particularly you guys, you're not getting paid extra to be here and give us information. We appreciate it and appreciate your future work. Um, I think that is a major game for the county where uh, I think, Thomas, you counted 28 individuals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 28 that, staff members. Exactly. That we don't have to have on our payroll 
you are incur the medical, the benefits, the everything, and we get better advice and numbers than we've had for the past 20 years. Thank you. Guys, that's all. I'm lo now looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Have <laughs> <laughs> two firsts and one second. <laughs> Aye. All in Aye. favor of say defy by saying Aye. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgov.com. TVNC.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.